Welcome Susan Thornton to join us uh, live from Lisbon, Maine in the United States. So Susan, it's uh, great to have you on the show for the very first time. It's really good that we finally established the line. How do you assess the outcome of the meeting? Do you think it achieved its objective from the U.S. perspective? Well, I think it did, um, you know, Shin. I think that the main point of the United States in having this meeting was to sort of restart communication between the United States and China that's really been in a hiatus for over two years now, at, at the leader level at least. And I think we needed to have that leader level connection, that sort of transmission to the rest of the governments that normalizes U.S.-China communication and allows us to talk about other things. So I think that was accomplished. The two leaders kind of set a tone for a business-like relationship going forward, and that's what they needed to do. Specifically, what do you think, uh, what kind of common ground do you think the two leaders are able to carve out or, or expand or reclaim, let's say? Uh, some American media outlets have said the meeting did not achieve any breakthroughs. What do you, how do you see this? Well, I think they were not really expecting to have a long list of deliverables. It was kind of different from previous summit meetings in that sense, where we used to prepare long lists of outcomes for the meetings. Um, this was more of a, a kind of a level setting between the two leaders, I think, trying to retrieve some of that common understanding and uh, common principles that we had had, you know, previously in the relationship and that have sort of eroded. And I think, um, you know, finding the floor in the relationship, reiterating all of the common uh, principles that we've had, uh, kind of sending that signal of um, things that have not changed is almost more important than coming up with new things that we can achieve. But I think there will be things now that we can talk about and put in the on the on the track, let's say, of of, resol of resolution or at least making progress on. Hmm. There is still, however, this gap of uh, the the guiding principles of bilateral ties from the U.S. side and from the Chinese side, for instance, for the United States, is primarily competition, but also you know seeking uh, opportunity of cooperation and, uh, uh, if necessary, you know conf even conflict confrontation. But on the Chinese side, uh, reiterated China, China reiterated is mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. Do you think under this gap? Um, still, the two countries can work out things? Well, I think there's going to be some work to be done for sure. China has sort of stood pat on its uh, formulation longstanding to describe the U.S. China relations, as you mentioned, sort of um, no conflict, non no confrontation. That's the peaceful coexistence. And then uh, this mutual respect was discussed quite a bit. And then this idea of not a zero sum competition, but a positive sum competition mm -hmm. from the Chinese side. Um, you know, I think the U.S. side would say that's fine, but it's probably not completely uh, reality focused and not complete because there are issues on which the U.S. and China have longstanding differences and which we haven't been able to bridge for the last 40 years and which will probably continue. And we have to manage those differences. But I think um, there is a lot of common ground, and the two presidents talked about that, certainly uh, on the sort of transnational issues like the global health issues, right. uh, climate change, of course. And then there were a number of regional issues and hot spots that they mentioned. I know they talked about Iran, trade, and energy markets. So those are all things that are of common concern where we need to coordinate and work together. On the issue of Taiwan, there seems to be a catch-22 situation. Now, President Biden told Xi, as a senator who voted for the Taiwan Relations Act, any effort to shape Taiwan's future by other than peaceful means is of great concern to the U.S. But from the Chinese perspective, should the separatist forces for Taiwan independence provoke us, these are the exact words, force our hands or even cross the red line, China would be propelled to take resolute measures. So how, in, according to you, how to manage this situation? without derailing bilateral ties or even veer into open conflict? Well, the bottom line is nobody wants a resolution of the Taiwan situation that's anything other than peaceful. I think it's 
um, probably most important actually for China to be able to have a resolution that's peaceful and not a military resolution, which would bring um, a lot of problems and and disaster really for, for China itself, never mind the region and the greater world. So I think all sides want to avoid that. The question is, you know, how can we reassure each other that we're not uh, veering across the red line, as was stated by the Chinese president? I think they made some progress on trying to kind of reassure each other that we're, we're not intending to cross the red line, and then we need to establish much better signaling and communication mechanisms to make sure we don't get there. I do think it's possible to handle this situation uh, with wisdom and maturity and avoid a conflict. Mm -hmm. We've done it for 40 years. It's been a great, I think, success, and I think we can keep doing it for quite a while more into the future. As to what will come next, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, mentioned during his readout to um, the Brookings Institution that the two presidents tasked their teams to coordinate expeditiously. How significant is that? Yeah, I think that will turn out to be significant. We have to watch and see what comes uh, in, the, in the few weeks ahead. But President Biden also mentioned in an in a offhand conversation after, or a comment to the news after he left um, an event in New Hampshire today that he's tasked, I think he said, four working groups, <coughs> excuse me, to work on various aspects and issues. And so I think we'll see whether those um, are able to get off the ground in the coming weeks. Intense competition requires intense diplomacy. That's also according to the Biden administration and Jake Sullivan repeated that. Now, the virtual meeting was definitely part of that. Do you think the spirit of engagement is back on the U.S. side? If so, what is different compared to the past? I don't know if I would call it the spirit of engagement, but I think definitely diplomacy is back. Um, and I think what we're going to see is making the world safe for diplomacy is part of what this meeting accomplished, meaning that now we'll see a number of counterparts on U.S. and Chinese sides <coughs> getting together and, and talking to try to solve problems. China says it doesn't have illusions about bilateral ties. <coughs> but uh, we'll stay the course moving forward. So what do you think the two sides really need to be careful with having emerged from the hiatus that you mentioned in the beginning of the conversation for China and for the United States respectively? Yeah, I think it's really important that both sides try to control their public posturing and their rhetoric, not to box in um, you know, their counterparts on the other side. I mean, both leaders have some uh, very tough domestic political situations that they're looking to handle in the coming year. Um, I know in Beijing, we have the Beijing Winter Olympics coming up, but then at the end of the year, the Party Congress. In the U.S., we have the midterm elections coming up. So I think it's very important to keep the lines of communication open and, and keep the public displays um, to a minimum. Try to handle things um, in channels that are properly set up to handle those issues. There's a lot of doubts, a lot of... Uh... Uh, suspicion and uh, criticism within the United States of what may come out of this meeting. Uh, for instance, there is this talk about, you know, President Biden uh, thinking about boycotting Beijing Olympics. However, how reliable that is, we do not know. So are we, um, could we be a bit too naive about the kind of atmosphere that U.S.-China relations will have to experience in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I think we should be prepared for, um, you know, additional uh, sort of uh, bumps in the road, if you will. Uh, you know, a lot of people in China always talk about U.S.-China relations being full of twists and turns. I think uh, right now we're even in a little bit of a turbulence period. Um, and, and, you know, we have to recognize that the events in the world are also very challenging and a little bit um, uncertain, right? So we could be buffeted also by by world events. But I think that with the leader level communication having cemented the kind of communication that we need to have, we have to take these events in strides and try to handle them and talk about them and uh, not let them derail completely this very important relationship 
you know, with all of the difficulties and all of the sort of overlapping interests, I mean, we really need to work on it in all of its complexity. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, China and the U.S. reached a three-point consensus on the treatment of journalists, so both sides will permit journalists to travel between each country under the condition that they follow pandemic-related protocols. What do you think of this development? Yeah, this is welcome development and long overdue, I think. And um, it just goes to show you how far things had kind of fallen that a simple technical issue like this took so long to resolve. But I'm really happy. Of course, the pandemic has, has interfered a little bit with the ability to resolve this quickly. But I'm really happy that now it's, it's been resolved and we'll see this uh, back on track and have the journalists going back, back to uh, report where they should be reporting. Yes, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Many thanks to Susan Thornton joining us from Lisbon, Maine in the U.S. He, she is former acting assistant secretary of state and now a senior fellow at the Yale Law School. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. You can download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to the YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.